Welcome to The Appetite, a podcast brought to you by Opal Food and Body Wisdom, an eating disorder treatment program in Seattle. This podcast seeks nuance and freedom in all things food, body, sport, and mental health. I'm your host, Carter Umhow. If you've listened to The Appetite before, you might have noticed that I introduced myself as a therapist, writer, and artist. In talking about so many different themes related to eating disorders, I've mostly brought my therapist self to this podcast. Today, however, in this bonus episode, I'll be sharing some of my writing. And then Opal co-founders Karabazi and Lexi Giblin will be joining me to discuss both my work and how the creative process is related to therapy. Though these poems aren't overtly tied into the eating disorder-related topics we usually talk about, I certainly mention food and body. But mostly, they are all about my relationship to myself. At the heart of any struggle, I believe that it is this relationship that is the hardest. These five poems are a glimpse into five different moments in my own relationship to myself. A lot of grief around losing a former version of myself, grief around my relationship to my own creativity, questions around what it means to be so absorbed in other people's lives as both a therapist, but also as a partner, a friend, an artist, a woman. They're about finding a voice. This first poem is one that I wrote almost like eight years ago now, Um, and it just is a glimpse into three different moments in my own life, all related to food. It's called Remember Fall. 1997, Brookville Market with Mom. Wearing red-fringed cowboy boots and green spandex, I watched a group of teenagers from the car's backseat window. They were crowded by the swings and slides, chatting before going home for dinner. I tumbled out of Mom's station wagon and crossed the street. At Brookville Market, Mom had me find snap peas and five acorn squash. I gathered them in my arms, stumbling through the produce aisle. She talked to the butcher about pork loin as I dumped our dinner into the cart. 2008, calling home from Greece. Before Thanksgiving, I finally called home and couldn't hear anything but the sounds that made his deep voice new. My father's voice sounded fresh, soft like the flesh around a stone fruit, yet pithy. I was 18 when I was last home for the holiday and was content spreading butter over brittle bread. Talking to Dad made me wonder where the pumpkins are on this island and whether or not fall really was the array of sorbet colors I remember. 2010, from my apartment. We roast squash, saute mushrooms, and toss them in arugula. From coffee mugs, we gulp table wine and laugh with bellies full. Our plates eaten clean, we take paper out and list the names of people we'd call homes in human form. We introduce one another. This next poem um, is kind of reflecting on an older version of myself. I really liked myself at 19. And um, I often kind of look back on that time in my life a little bit too idealistically. (laughs) Um, So this poem is kind of about re-encountering that part of myself. I met myself last night on a page. Just 19 years old, but I respected her wild experimental craft. At that age, I had fewer resources, so I wrote the words down that I wouldn't speak and sculpted poems for survival instead. I turned the walnut in my throat into some kind of wagabosh wild worship. I crooned cuckoo just to get it out and to let it be said. But now this, this is the same heart. The heart that waltzed slow on a roped rug, wine sloshed and spaghetti full. This is the same heart I've covered and slaughtered, and sabotaged. My ache is the same, and my heart still flutters, flounders, figures it out. I am alive and always wise, always wrong. There's something hopeful here in the life I have, though. In these faces, in these ferns, in the drumming rhythm of windshield wipers. It looks more like how I've dreamed of it to look. I, on the other hand look less internally like the person I've remembered myself to be. Am I a ruse? A ruse? A ruse? Maybe simply I'm too outwardly focused, 
too fragmented and scattered across iPhone apps and friends and meshed I love but cannot leave, what if I came back to myself? Let moments matter more. Let myself loose. What if I gave myself 19-year-old weight? I was heavier then. I had heavier thighs and heavier feelings. I had heavier thoughts and heavier leanings. What if I came back to myself? Gave that girl more weight? What if I let myself loose and held her wild winning hand so we could rise up together like paper lanterns, lifted wishes, heavy enough to take flight? You might have heard me mention um, my relationship to writing in that one. This next one is also, it has a bit of a nod to kind of my relationship to myself as a writer as well. And maybe also just not think of myself as a writer anymore some days. I don't have a poem about roses or peonies, how each tightly bound bud unfurls layer after layer after layer, blush pink or crimson, unending complexity, a floral portrait of what I'd like to be. I don't have a poem about the tree above my back door, fresh winter fruit and orange blossoms along the floor. I don't have a poem about wringing out their sweet scent from the bottom of my shoes, a clear sense of home as I'd like it to be. I don't have a poem about something beautiful or right, syntax, sandwiching, specifics, or some meticulous metaphor molded between cappuccino sips. I don't have a poem that I wrote because I finally knew where to start with my grief, what went wrong, and how I'd like it to be. Because I have work days that are long days, that wring me out and wear me thin, draining all my resilience for someone else's kin. I have no poem about the elegance of laying resigned on my couch watching freaks and geeks, Tate's cookies and old Christmas nuts on repeat. How I keep forgetting numbness isn't how my heart wants to live or be. But I have Christopher in my ear saying to me, you do not have to heal and change at the same time, reminding me I can sink my teeth into not knowing a thing. I don't have to heal and change at the same time. I may change from doing all this healing, but healing does not come simply because of some bold change. I have time. Whew. Okay. Um, That one always gets me a little worked up there at the end. Um, This next poem is kind of a little bit more about kind of the delight of, of being alone, the delight that I find in my own relationship to myself, how I just find it kind of the best thing ever some days. Being alone. Biting into the tangy flesh of a peach while standing on the side of the street, laughing in my own head as my torso leans forward so the juice can drip where it may. I love having no one else around to distract me from Rice Krispies in milk. During that two-minute window when temperature and texture are at their highest contrast, cold, crackly, and worthy of my ravenous mouth. I love a cold plunge into rushing waters, my breath panting to catch up, that deep relief. Being alone, being alone and finding it the most delicious thing in the world. Being alone and wrapping my thirsty arms around the container of my own body, making my own space. For writing in the morning without worrying about a thing for lying around sideways, upside down, and covered in glue, making my own space, for a meticulous record of each inkling, my own private poetry slam, beers in the bathtub and dancing on the sink. I like my aloneness. I love my aloneness. I could schedule out my days hour by hour, not enough hours in the day to make all the dates I'd make with myself. An hour for rising slowly and watching the light on the wall. An hour for coffee and a crumpet. Three hours to write. Two hours to bathe. Two more hours to write. An hour to stretch. Two hours to dance. Stretch again and run. Lie on the floor alone. Think some more alone. Need to reach out to someone? Write a letter alone. 
I am so hungry for myself, ravenous for my own insides, but I gut myself out and give me away, empty myself out like a horse for its rider. I cannot keep life inside me if I offer it as a blanket to everyone else. Yet I am such a hungry thing. There's a pit in my stomach that says it's not okay to find myself so delicious. But maybe for now, I'll stay smothered. Covered, though, in the tangy flesh of peach that I'll let drip and drip and drip down my wrist and between my fingers, covering my chin in streams of sweetness, keeping me for myself. Um, This next and last poem is, well, you'll find out. (laughs) I watched my best friend labor in a bathtub last week. I was called in between contractions and I rushed there, coming in from the worst January rain with one bottle of water, two string cheeses, one sandwich and one bagel, two juices and three pastries in tow, all in paper Starbucks bags packed to the edges, hoping that if I covered all the major food groups, even if I didn't have the right thing to say, I would have something valuable to offer. I've watched the women around me grow babies in their bellies, creating space inside themselves that I don't think I have. I've watched my best friends holding children in their arms that they made, while I myself struggle with believing I can make anything of value to me at all. But when I walked into the delivery room, I walked in teary-eyed, honored and humble and silent. The delivery room was quieter than I expected. The voice of my best friend, the only audible voice in the room. Everyone else around her in a sacred hush. And I saw her on knees and hands, the sway of her hips, stomach reaching to the ground, the whole room centered around her body, her body like a force rooting down. She spoke sparingly. I wandered around the quiet room, bottle of juice in my hand, a straw available for her lips. Her breath started picking up pace, teeth clenched, the of my best friend. Hours passed and her body swayed wider as her baby boy came closer and closer down. I saw her shoulders slump a little, and with her voice she said, I don't think I can do this. But then she gathered our warm faces with her eyes and through a seething breath went (sighs) 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 From the back of the room, I watched her knees slip a little on the floor of the bathtub getting shaky. Voices around her speaking up now. You're as strong as a lion. She winced a little, body hunched and used her voice and said, I don't feel like a lion anymore. I don't feel like a lion anymore. But then she felt her husband's palm on the small of her back rising in and out of the water. She then grasped her own mother's hands, gathering all the lion back into her, and used her voice. Started talking to her own baby boy through clenched teeth. Baby boy, we're almost there. Baby boy, I can't wait to meet you. Baby boy, you're doing so good. Is this not what a voice is for? To speak out loud your slumping shoulders and to let it be known? I don't feel like a lion anymore. Is this not what a voice is for? To call it out and then to call yourself up. Letting yourself fall apart just a little bit so you can bring yourself back together again. Baby boy, baby boy, I'm here, she said with her voice. I have watched my best friends grow babies in their bellies, create space that I don't think I have. So my voice, my voice, what is it for? I hear it booming through this room, though the echo of it between seats. My voice, I have no idea what it sounds like to you. 
Is it supposed to sound sharp in cadence, voice of a slam poet, provocative, loud, on beat? Is my voice supposed to sound clear or strong? Because I, too, don't feel like a lion anymore. I have watched the women around me birth babies and businesses, and I don't know. I don't know. I once was full of clarity, persistence. I don't feel like a lion anymore. I have heard so many stories from other people's mouths, I myself trying their voices on as harmony to my own. I have heard so much that my own voice no longer booms in my own head. It's become overcrowded in here. Isn't that what a voice is for? I hear my own voice in unison now. I don't feel like a lion anymore. Saying it out loud is good enough. I don't feel like a lion anymore. Is this not what a voice is for? To let deep sighs out to be known. (sighs) 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 Baby boy, you're almost here, my best friend says with her voice. I talk to myself. Baby girl, you're doing so good. Here we go. Hmm. Well, wow, Carter. Carter. (laughs) (laughs) How did that, how was it to do that, to read the poetry? It's really a fun experience to read poetry. I feel really, um, I feel really embodied when I do it. Mm. I think that especially writing and being alone in a room typically to, to write, it's such a different experience to get to read it out loud and, um, to just share stories that I, I don't normally articulate in the way that I'd want to, which would be that way, the way that mm. I read them. Do yeah. you find yourself feeling the emotion of the poems as you move through them? I do. Um, I feel like that's part of my goal, mm. certainly. Um, but also just getting to write something rather than say it for me, it, it definitely means that I've processed it already. So I know what I'm saying in a really different way than when I am just talking in conversation. I know what I am saying because I've sorted through it and I've really decided this is my thought on this. This is my feeling Mm -hmm. about this. Mm -hmm. And so when I read it out loud, it feels like it's coming from a very um, potent place and a very, uh, a place full of clarity too. So when I start speaking, I definitely can feel that emotion more readily than elsewhere in my life. (laughs) Yeah. As the listener, I could, I could feel the emotion for sure Mm -hmm. in a way that, yeah, just our normal conversational talking doesn't quite Mm -hmm. capture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It feels like it slows down life for a moment, you know, and you just really are mindful to what's happening. I love, love Mm -hmm. what, how that, how poetry does that for the listener. Yeah. That's such a good way to put it such a good way to put it I want to I'm curious about you and your relationship (laughs) to writing yes um so tell us more about what the journey of your life and how (laughs) writing intersects with your story Mm. I don't really remember much of a time when I wasn't writing actually um I was thinking about this well I think about this a lot but I remember the first time I started writing poems I could say that with air quotes because I think I was actually more inspired to write music um, and write songs because I really loved the country singer Mary Chapin Carpenter. (laughs) And I just felt so moved by her music at five years old. I remember getting my first notebook and basically just copying down the lyrics as I could hear them (laughs) with my horrible handwriting and limited vocabulary. And um, I felt like I was sort of taking in the world and making it my own. And I remember that really distinctly still. I was on a road trip listening to the music and looking out the window in North Carolina. And I still remember um, and that's, I think, where it started. And it is weird because it, it does feel like a really clear sense from an early age of, of me taking things in that way. Mm-hmm. And um, there were little hints of this in, I think, particularly the poem about being 19. Um, but writing, I think, was the place where I 
learned how to have a voice. I felt very much uh, emotionally inhibited, I guess, uh, as a as a teenager, and it was the place where I could could figure out what I was thinking. And now I can understand too that I had a lot of like physical sensation in my body of anxiety or all kinds of stuff. And I just wanted to get it out. I, I needed to get it out of my body. And the best way to do that was to think, well, how does this feel? Could I write that down? And so I started really articulating my emotions by putting words to them, but metaphor mostly, like, you know, just kind of the knots in your stomach. But I think, what does this really feel like? What is it? What kind of room do I imagine myself in? I was just thinking really creatively. Mm-hmm. So um, writing started there. It started actually as like a therapeutic tool, um, which is why I got into therapy. I think mm-hmm. because I actually had had all of these creative experiences that had felt so therapeutic. And I was I was focused on writing poetry, particularly throughout school. It was my major in college. Um, I got a grant at one point to go write some poems. And I just kept thinking, like, this stuff is this is where healing is happening. This is where people actually get to talk about um, the process of letting something go or creating a sense of self. It happens in writing so often. And and then with painting, too, which I do, it felt like um, the creative process really mirrored kind of your own, to me, like, like a conversation around self-talk. Like you can hear your your critic come up so much when you're being creative. And so to actually work through that by creating more and destroying something and Kind of making it go better or trying to articulate something, you're doing a lot of therapeutic work and psychological reshaping, I think, when you're being creative. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I have a lot to say It's really cool to hear you talk about it. Oh, yeah. good. And it's, it's, it's interesting because I just think of the abstract way that you think mm-hmm. it then seems to lend well to having things maybe be better expressed in metaphor and yeah. ways of getting at something better abstractly mm-hmm. whereas I have such a concrete brain mm-hmm. that I did I mean I, I don't relate to this in, in my own history of of having um having writing be that kind of tool and so it's really just it's so interesting and fascinating yeah. to hear you talk about it and I'm, I'm imagining listeners there's some listeners that are you know really understanding mm-hmm. ha- understanding and relating to that and maybe some like me that are just fascinated by it yeah yeah it's so fascinating for me to think about not not thinking a metaphor. Mm-hmm. Like, what? What do you think about? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I'm not always like setting metaphors to things in my life at this point, but that's where my brain goes crazy and I get like the most connected and excited when when there's metaphor to be had or I start thinking kind of more and like translating my experience more viscerally, which is I think why I write about food a lot mm-hmm. because yes. there's such a huge visceral sensory sensual connection to food um and i also have my own story with food too but it it feels like the place where i feel attached and and rooted and i can use a lot of food to describe those things yeah i noticed that in um this especially in the alone poem i don't remember the name of that poem but um the delight and using the words delicious and Mm. hunger for self and really speaking to desire and how you're articulating a lot of desire through the senses. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That poem was like that. I found that in my closet last week. (laughs) I found it in my closet last week before I did um, the performance at the round at the Fremont Abbey, which is where I kind of Mm -hmm. started doing some of this stuff out loud this month. But um, I found it and I remember the experience very well of, of, writing that and feeling like I think it was before work honestly one day where it was maybe a later morning where I went into work and I just was like I don't want to leave my apartment (laughs) there's so many things I want to do and I just feel so at home in in my space and in my body and um I could I could literally do that all day yeah not all days but <laughs> I know I love that. The I'm hour you do this, and then the yeah. two hours that you <laughs> yeah bathe and then write, and then <laughs> da, da, da. right. That was awesome. Oh, thanks. Mm. There's something um I want to hear a little bit more about is um how you've used writing in your own discovery of self and mm. your own therapy. 
mm-hmm. and under, I want to understand more about how it's changed you. Like, so you yeah. write something down on a piece of paper, you find the word mm-hmm. that fits the word or words that fit with your experience. And then maybe talk to us about what happens from yeah. there. So let me think specifically, um, cause I think that will probably do the best. So when I wrote a couple of these poems, um, I wrote them this month for this performance at the round, like I mentioned, and I was invited to read poems in this space. And I have a lot of poems lying around from other times in my life and not a lot from right now. And that really is upsetting to me because I do identify so much as as a writer and I haven't been writing as much um, in this season of my life working um, I think as a therapist, but the output <laughs> of, mm-hmm. of therapy. So it's changed my patterns a little bit. And so when I when I was thinking about writing poems for that, I felt like I need to bring myself into the room. And something about the old stuff is not going to feel good. What is it that's happening now that I need to speak about? And I was having a really hard time because I kept I kept feeling like, well, I don't have anything. That's the point. The point is, is that I don't have anything to say these days, is that I don't feel connected to myself. And that's why I'm not writing. So I don't I can't write. <laughs> I was like freaking out about it, obviously, for a few weeks because I had a deadline and I had to do it. And there really hundreds of people there. And woof. so um, I started trying to articulate that. I think that that's that was the turning point where I felt like I was in this muck of I don't know where I am. I don't know who I am right now. Um, But once I started articulating, like, the fact that I don't have a poem, that poem, I don't have a poem, came from lying in the bathtub and and trying to write and, you know, leaving my laptop and my notebook in the other room, just kind of (laughs) needing a break. Um, And I started, like, writing the poem out loud because I started hearing, oh, I don't have a poem. That's a line maybe in and of itself, or it could be. Um, And something about articulating that launched me into then understanding, okay, there there is something really specific about this season of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, there's something really specific about it, and it has a story like any other time in my life. And what are the specifics? Um, it, <laughs> I wrote about freaks and geeks and Tate's cookies and old Christmas nuts. And like, okay, that's not as, that's not what I expected for me to be writing about or caring about, but that's what's happening. And so there's something I think about getting specific that is really healing and transformative. Um, So, yeah, that's a little bit of like an example of what I did this time. But there's also been times in my life where I've dealt with trauma that way, where there there were so many details that were kind of rushing around in my head for so many years around different, more traumatic events in my life. And they just stayed there. They stayed up there. And no matter how much I sort of talked through some of the feelings attached. It wasn't until I could get really specific about the visceral details that I was able to move through it. Um, And I think that there's something really powerful when we find the right words that really articulate the, the nuanced experience that we have. And it's in that specificity that there's actually more emotional access, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is something that I talk to clients about a lot, that the more specific you get into your own experience, the more you actually start moving into the universal. You actually start moving more into something that's going to be connecting for others, too. And that's not initially what it's about, but it's crazy with poetry in particular. You get so specific in these tiny little details, and yet you don't always know what a poet is talking about. Um, And it's because an impression is made. Um, You can enter and access someone's life. You can enter and access your own life. And yet suddenly then the emotional experience comes back um, because you've been specific again. Um, And it's, I think the vague stuff doesn't work as much. Sounds like you're integrating left brain and right brain experience. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why I think creative expression is so important it in, sounds a in lot, therapy. Sounds a lot like somatic work yeah. in that way, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I hear elements of exposure therapy, you know, going yeah. into those, the what you don't want to remember almost. Some of those specifics would be that, you know. Absolutely. 
Yeah. Kind of changing is, your relationship to those specifics almost. Right. Yeah. Because if you go back in and you are the one crafting it now, mm-hmm. there's something really powerful yeah. and um, empowering in that. Like, these are the details of my life and I get to now choose what context I'm putting them in. Um, and you are, you're, you're going back in into the nitty gritty. And I kind of think of it like you're putting... Um, hydrogen peroxide into a wound like you're really going in and sort of clearing some things out but but it's it's more like maybe that's not the right metaphor because it it sort of is like you're planting seeds there um and new stuff gets to grow once you've you've seen what's there yeah i don't know if the listeners know that you um facilitate a group at opal called shame and play yeah so maybe you could share what you do in that group and how you're using writing or poetry to facilitate Mm -hmm. healing yeah. So um, Jenny Wade, who used to work at Opal, um, she and I created the curriculum and it had initially come out, I think, actually, it was when I was new at Opal. And I remember um, you guys said, How could you do like a group on like life skills, or, like, res- <laughs> like resume writing? Yeah, discharge writing, I think it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I was like, I mean, I know how to write resumes kind of. And um, <laughs> what I actually think would be really significant and what I could really do well is is bringing in writing and therapy um and so I had this idea of bringing in some of the the work that I've done as a writer and an artist into the space um and Jenny was excited about it so she joined me too and the the group is around using creative expression to build shame resilience um under the assumption that that shame is is so much in the details and it it creates kind of a narrative around who you are and what you are in the world. And so to go in and again, get specific, what is the narrative that's actually happening here? Creative expression can do a lot of that work. Um, So we do, we've done different writing prompts before. Um, I didn't share my own poem on this, but we do where I'm from poems, which is a way to kind of get the clients into a, narrative of their life their life story um but again through the visceral so the sounds the taste the smells the phrases that are indicative of their home um and their upbringing or their background or whatever they can they whatever they choose and it is i think a really powerful experience because the clients are bolder i think in that space I think, again, because they really are owning these details that they can sort of use as, uh, well, they can use the poem as like a third object, um, which I think is really important. So it's not just, hey, I'm going to tell you this thing. And then the relational stuff is all there, too. The relationship's going to show up in whatever you write or whatever you create as well. But first, you get to have this externalized version of yourself um, through art. So, yeah. Um, there's a lot I could say about it, but, but yeah, so we do that. We do like different portraits of different parts of self and kind of getting to, to investigate, um, who we are through more visuals, um, and yeah, imagining, imagining, um, what it looks like to externalize different parts of ourselves or different emotions and get to know them better that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just imagining the listeners um, yeah. hearing all this and just the kind of bigger thematic challenge of taking time to be with oneself <laughs> mm-hmm. and in all forms of that, right? Like yeah. how do we stay connected with who we are when we're living in an age that there's so many distractions mm-hmm. with, I think that was in one mm-hmm. of your poems, right? About cell phones yes. and yes. social media and all these ways that we tune out. We mm-hmm. might tune out to get some breaks, but then that's not really tuning into ourselves. And I think you were talking about that in your, Mm -hmm. in your poetry as well. Yeah. Do you, yeah. Do you have any more thoughts in terms of what might be coming up for listeners and, and even just imagining? Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, what I said before about going through a writing process and not having anything to write kind of fits here too, that it, it's not easy to be with yourself Um, And there are so many different reasons for that. I think a lot of days for me, it's just that I'm distracted um, or exhausted and it feels like it's going to hurt more to pay attention. (laughs) 
<laughs> to myself. And some days it does, but actually it feels way better, right? <laughs> um, but I I think that my my word around that is is that I think you need to just start wherever you are. And like if you have if you're asked to write, and I'm often asking clients to write when they don't want to, um, or if you're trying to write on your own and you don't want to, just start with what what's first. What is the first thing that you know? And maybe that's I don't want to do this. I don't want to write. I don't have anything to say. And then you follow that thought and then you follow the next one and you follow the next one and you eventually get somewhere else that's more connected. Um, but what what is true is that you maybe don't want to do it. <laughs> and there are reasons for that and probably good ones. There's probably a big cost to be connected to yourself. Uh, for a lot of people, that doesn't go well in their circles or in their life. If they're really truly connected, then maybe they not really like their friends or not really like their job or not really feel very safe. So you just start <laughs> um, and you write about what you do have. So you write about the resistance you have to writing. Um, and I think that, that that's been really fruitful. Um, again, with the clients and shame and play, the, something that comes up so much with the where I'm from poems is people saying, I don't like, I don't like where I'm from. Or I don't really remember much. And I think that that's an invitation to then see how, see what your relationship is to yourself or to not remembering or to the fact that you don't like it. And again, begin with what you have. Like, and I hear in that, yeah. just be honest mm -hmm. with yourself too. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have to force yourself into it, into mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And I, it's, it's interesting to hear you speak about that because I think I hear in your, in your work, there are a lot of themes of finding, you know, trying to find yourself mm -hmm. and trying to find out what's, what's going on, you know, with, um, relationship to self, re-encountering yourself, mm -hmm. noticing numbness and, yeah. um, yeah. So I just think that that's probably, it's interesting because it's probably a lot of what you do is sit, it sounds like you sit with something that feels empty and then you move from Mm -hmm. there at times. Yeah, I try yeah. to. <laughs> I try to. And if I'm not writing, if I'm doing visual art, I I feel like I just, I start with what I'm attracted to as well. Like what it, what is the thing that draws you to the world in general? I'll, I've written a lot about that before. Just like this is the first thing that I like when I'm looking out a window. Okay, that's interesting. That says something about who I am. If I'm really attracted to all the scraps of trash on the road rather than the flowers. What does that say about me? But in visual art, I'll just say to clients or say to myself too, what is the first thing that you can start with? Is it just a color? Is it the fact that you have so much physical energy in your body right now and you don't want to do this at all? Can you find some sort of tool in this room, on your desk, whatever, that you can get the physical energy out with? It's probably not going to be like soft, gentle watercolors. It's maybe going to be like a sharp pen that rips through the page and that's where you start yeah mm -hmm. and it, as somebody who's more concrete in my thinking I know mm -hmm. for me it was helpful as an entry point into some of this is thinking more around the senses because mm -hmm. that can be more concrete yeah. of what think you know sight sound yes smell and describing those and seeing what you're paying attention to right right mm -hmm. and that's why again like this can be really helpful in your relationship to yourself because you have a body <laughs> right exactly. so even if your mind's not going abstract or m metaphoric um you have a body that's taking in information and so are you paying attention to the information you're taking in and this can be a wonderful way writing i think can be a wonderful way to just be present to to notice what is around you and to realize what's going on in your day and to I've I've written a lot on trains. I'm thinking of that right now. Just like looking out a window and what are you taking in? Um, and so it's just attachment to your senses. I feel like that's it. And often when you find out what you are noticing, there's probably a metaphor in there too for why you're <laughs> <Yeah>. noticing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? Why poetry? I know you you've yeah. talked about poetry as mm -hmm. um, an ex an artistic expression mm -hmm. that you maybe sometimes recommend over others. Yeah. Same I mean, same. I think that I've done some like creative nonfiction stuff too, but it's always sort of poetic. Um, and I think it's, 
that that theme of specificity, I think, is why poetry feels really significant. And I think good writing in general is specific. Um, but poetry asks you to be really connected to your senses, I think, um, and allows you to sort of collage things together that aren't necessarily normally together. Um, and that I don't know about you guys, but that's how my brain works during the day. I'm fi- I find myself in a meeting or with a friend or whatever and or tasting something and suddenly, bam, like I'm back to being 12 in this exact space and I can this memory comes up or some association. So I feel like poetry can can really blend worlds worlds together. Um, it doesn't have to be linear um, because I don't I mean, I think we might all think in some concrete and linear ways, but also our memories, I don't think, are are linear. Um, so that's part of it. But yeah, the specificity, I think, is is a huge part. Um, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just thinking about this kind of broader concept um, that I've brought into shame and play a ton, but also has been kind of a big guiding force for me um, as I connect creativity to the therapeutic process of it. I was reading uh, this book many, many years ago called Free Play. It's by a man named Stephen Nakmanovich, and I think he's a composer, but he wrote a book on improv and improv in music, but also improv just in life in general. And in the introduction, the, um, the he, he introduces this Sanskrit word called lila, and it's defined. Have you guys heard this? No, it just sounds like my daughter's daughter's name, name. (laughs) which is Sanskrit. Ela, yeah. Oh, really? Uh Sanskrit? Cool. My sister's name is Lila, so it's spelled that way, but with a carrot over the eye. Mm -hmm. Um, And it means divine play, and they define that as um, as kind of being in touch with the process of creation, and so being kind of so much in the flow of something that you become, you come out of yourself. And yet you're so deeply in yourself at the same time. It's this really weird paradox. Um, and I think he defines Leela specifically as as being in the process of creation, which is always creating something and then watching it kind of be destroyed mm-hmm. and then having to recreate. And then that gets destroyed and then recreating, et cetera. Um, and that's the cycle of life. Like those are the seasons. But also that happens in our own process of grief and building new things in our lives and sense of self. Um, And then it also happens when you're making something. So when you're making a poem or when I'm doing an oil painting and the first layer is just horrible or that first draft of a poem is horrible, you put it all out there and then you say, this is sort of shit. (laughs) And you, you break it all down and you pull parts away or you have to in painting I'd like wipe everything off and there would be like a hint still of what used to be there and then you'd build again and it's it I talk about it and I'm like this sounds like life right but it it's kind of a cool way doing art to to participate in that process and consciously participate in the process um because it can bring you so much healing I think when you're aware I'm doing this thing physically that also means something to me so personally. And that's, I think, why people, like, train for for sport as well. Right. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push myself really hard. I know I'm scared. And every day I'm going to do a little bit better. And you, like, participate in something that, that gets you better. Yeah, the or, process part of it. Yes, mm-hmm. I think we need to be in process. Mm-hmm. And what we learn about ourselves in the processes versus right. just the outcome of the, whether it's the poem or the competition or the... yes. You learn so much. You learn so it much. It reminds me of your fifth poem where you talk about falling apart and then putting yourself back together mm-hmm. again. Mm-hmm. The labor poem. Yeah. 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 Yeah, totally. I think that that was probably somewhere in my head as I was thinking about that, mm-hmm. watching a friend be in labor and watching her body just, again, like slump a little bit and lose so much steam <laughs> and then finally getting something out enough of her body by words mm-hmm. To then recharge and then try again. Um, I, yeah, it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I loved the, like the social, the connection she had with those in the room yeah. and how that helped her put herself back together again. Totally. It's beautiful. Yeah. 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 That says a lot too about like 
I think again with with making something and why that's therapeutic too is is it can be really personal, but then it becomes relational if you share it. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe you feel totally ashamed, and maybe that's a sign too that typically when you share yourself, you're ashamed, art or not, right? Um, but but like I I did not think I had any poems to read when I after I wrote a lot of these and then read them out loud, they came to life, and it was because I was in a room with people. Um, I think I could hear myself sort of practice in my apartment by myself and say, okay, that sounds okay. Um, but really getting to tell someone changed the words, I'd say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's so neat you're sharing it now with a Thank bigger you. audience. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Love it. And just I'm imagining just all different people, what what it evokes in them to hear mm-hmm. those images and mm-hmm. what that kind of, what that brings both with sensation or emotion that, yeah, how your poetry helps us connect yeah, with ourselves. ourselves. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that would be my hope. Yeah. 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 Well, I think and I think it is Thank happening. You. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us for this kind of different episode. It was really fun to get to share a little bit more of my work and get to talk about it too. Um, If you want to learn more about my work, writing or art, you can find me at carterumhow.com or on Instagram. We will link those in the description box. Please subscribe to The Appetite on iTunes or SoundCloud or whatever you'd like and leave us a rating or comments if you've enjoyed what you've been hearing. To connect more with Opal, you can find us at opalfoodandbody.com or on Facebook or Twitter. We also have an appetite email, which we would love to hear from you on. You can email any questions or suggestions, things you'd like us to talk about, and we'll get back to you on there. So it's the appetite at opalfoodandbody.com. Thanks to Jack Straw Cultural Center for sound engineering. Thank you to Aaron Davidson for the appetite signature music and to Sarah Taylor for production assistance and editing. Talk to you guys soon.